you're either magnesium deficient, you've got too much estrogen, which slows down COMT as well. You're setting yourself up for this recipe of anxiety. So the only way to get around that is. It, 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 it's really dependent on, on everybody because I did, like ch chase this trend, like 350 milligrams of train per week alongside all this test and EQ and he's, he felt fine. Yeah, which is interesting because that would be like the worst combo for me is super, super high test and low trend. Yeah, and EQ with trend. I mean, it's like anxiety in the bottle. And he's the chillest motherfucker I know. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> well, but that's that, it. Like a lot of it's your innate personality, right? It's just going to yeah. bring out what you are. So it's just yeah. a super cool yeah. guy. So yeah. That, that aspect of the anxiety is COMT, that enzyme clearing dopamine. So if you do have anxiety issues with androgens, more than likely you're either magnesium deficient, like what me and Kerr talked about. Mm -hmm. You've got too much estrogen, which slows down COMT as well, because COMT clears estrogen out. It, it methylates estrogen to, to excrete it after it becomes estrone. Mm -hmm. And the other side of it is androgens slow it down as well, depending on the dose. So yep. you're setting yourself up for this recipe of anxiety. So the only way to get around that is support COMT through magnesium if you're unfortunate and genetically you've got a slow comt you're probably not going to tolerate high levels of androgens because that enzyme is just going to come to a bottleneck and you're just going to feel really on edge or you're going to have ruminating thoughts you know all of these negative things that come from uh bad experiences with androgens all comes back to that genetic level of comt so when we're talking about magnesium, we're talking about supplementing with maybe 100 to 200 milligrams of magnesium glycinate or citrate with meals. And then the last meal of the day could be like 300 milligrams magnesium from magnesium threonate, well, which the, is like three or four grams because the threonate contains so much of the tablets. Yeah. So the, the like when, when me and Kurt discussed it, 10 milligrams per kilogram body weight is like the literature set point as mm -hmm. the minimum level. Um, so like someone who's a hundred kilos, that's a thousand milligrams. Yeah. And if you look at, you know, two capsules of magnesium with glycine has 150. Mm -hmm. So if you're yeah. doing, you know, two trout a day for four meals, you're only getting to, you know, 600. So you've taken, you know, eight capsules and you've gotten to 600. When you say the guys, you know, you might need 16 capsules of magnesium per day to get you know, above a thousand, they're like looking at you with a funny face and you're like, well, magnesium is very difficult to get from food. Um, nowadays, you know, yes. Nowadays, like we, we spoke about it, a hundred grams of spinach, raw spinach, which is like a bag of spinach, has like 90 milligrams of magnesium. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's it's very difficult to get the, or like the RDA is set at three to 400 milligrams, but you know how flawed a lot of the RDAs and upper yeah, tolerable yeah, yeah. limits have been derived that, with magnesium 10 milligrams per kilogram the trick that we spoke about is your alp enzyme and mm -hmm. your blood yep. work should be above 70. if it's not yep. above 70 you it's need more magnesium. magnesium correct oh really and, yep and that's, that's the, what okay. we use it for okay so uh, my alkaline phosphatase is always a little bit on the low side and but my zinc intake and my magnesium intake is sky high it's possible the magnesium's not high enough so the other side maybe here, Copper, like what you're talking about on the, the last sort of setup, Steve, that your, yeah. mm -hmm. your copper balance, you know, and I recently read into a lot of the studies of how like the upper tolerable limit of copper was derived. Um, and it was based on what is the minimum amount we can put in food for prisoners, basically. And they okay. then, they, that was how they came up with the, yeah. the RDA for copper. Um, and then they sort of looked at what was this sort of, a, a, a potential toxic dose in rats and then multiplied it by 10 for humans and that's sort of where they ended up broadly at that sort of 10 milligram upper limits but uh, looking if you go and look at studies there's uh, no potential uh, toxicity from even case reports of high copper intake as well so that 10 milligrams that people are always like oh i can't go above that from what I've read recently, it looks like people can go above 10 milligrams of copper, depending on the zinc balance and magnesium. I was going to say it'll block zinc yeah. is the problem. Yeah. You know, yeah. but most bodybuilders taking a ton of zinc, I mean, yeah. you're taking loads Sorry. of zinc, you end up driving copper down, you drive yep. ceruloplasmin down. So, and then magnesium and then iron suffers goes down. That's, that's and iron goes with it. Yeah. You know, yeah. and it's the four of them are intimately linked that 
magnesium is you know the one mineral that most guys that they have mental issues sleep problems energy problems you know currently i think 2000 milligrams of elemental magnesium per day you know yeah. between uh, yeah, same different, here. different types of supplements and yeah I, I i wish i'd done it a lot sooner like you know i i guess i learned all this probably three to four years properly into bodybuilding at those first three to four years you're, you're trying mm. to learn and figure things out that if you can tell someone this from the immediate set point of going it's just it's such an easy thing it, it does add a bit of cost but it's it's relatively cheap and the benefit no, towards your sleep yeah, yeah and it's your mood um it's just one of those ones that stay on top of because if you do have anxiety most of the time it's magnesium deficiency yeah, and of course, if your if your copper levels are low, then your iron levels are low, and you need iron for neurotransmitter synthesis, uh, including magnesium. I mean, a lot of people overlook that, and then now there's a movement about keeping your iron levels super low for longevity purposes, which does make sense. But then you're sacrificing your neurotransmitter synthesis in the process, mm -hmm. which are also going to be you know skewed from the steroids yeah. and then whatever else that you're taking. So I take about 200 milligrams magnesium or magnesium from magne magnesium bisglycinate every single meal, six times per day. So that's about 1200 milligrams. And then another magnesium three and eight, 300 milligrams. So that's 1500. And then I get about 800 milligrams of magnesium for my diet. Um, but how much of that is bioavailable? You don't know how much of that is oxidized or, or the, the fiber that I'm eating prevents the absorption, right? So it, it makes it a little bit difficult. Um, I'm willing to experiment to bring my magnesium intake up, see see what happens, see if I can raise my alkaline phosphatase, um, and then and then get some additional benefits. Maybe yeah. I'll feel even more calm. Because when you think about it, I, I was going to say that the final thing with like ALP is because ALP brings phosphate into your cells. So the more mm. ALP you have, the more phosphate, and then the more ATP you can make. So you can see how all of a sudden your energy level goes up from uh, magnesium intake. Yep. I was going to say with the, so we're talking about like kind of biohacking stuff, right? Mm -hmm. With the longevity. I think I, I get a lot of guys that follow some of this stuff. They, they have to understand that most of the data comes from rats in a cage where they're not at harm. Yeah. Right. So they can just extend their lives, right? They reduce their food. They reduce their insulin. They reduce all these things. IGF is low. The bottom line in humans, it's generally the opposite, right? Like you don't want rapamycin high. You don't want IGF low in a man. You don't want all the, you don't, fasting insulin doesn't make a difference. There's no effect on longevity to a degree right outside of diabetes or yeah. some other disease but like these are not things that are relevant to really humans in the wild wild um living long right that's kind of no. the, actually, the opposite because you'll be feeble and weak and i think yeah, right. and and people overlook just the simple basics of putting on some muscle and eating right to keeping your oxidative yeah. stress low and then they want to do all these longevity drugs and protocols to extend their life when the basics are just missing so that's why i always laugh um, back at that, they don't look at the total picture. They look at one simple or one single thing, but the total picture is always lacking. Yeah. Well, like that's even um, then when you look at blood work, it, like the whole thing about iron, the two main ones, the reason about iron is what we've sort of come to realize in the last maybe six years is ferroptosis from iron overload, which is basically mm. iron induced cellular death. And yeah. that's due to iron overload being a, an oxidant and basically it sets off a cascade that tells the cell die. You can easily look at that in your blood work and that your ferritin should be in generally from the literature sub 150 and your GGT should be between 16 and 20. They're like your, your hallmarks of low iron overload or low risk of ferroptosis. And that's sort of where the whole thing about keep your iron intake low. It's because iron is an oxidant like glucose. Um, but like the reference range for ferritin in, in Europe or the UK anyway, goes up to like 450, 500. Um, and the way I always explain, you know, and I read it uh, in a, a great book, um, another copper book by a guy, Morley Robbins, I think his name was, um, that ferritin is like an empty shotgun shell, basically. So when ferritin is in your bloodstream, the heavy chains of ferritin don't have any iron. So ferritin basically has been released into the bloodstream but as soon as ferritin is in the bloodstream it already releases its iron so when you've got high ferritin you've actually dumped the iron that was in that ferritin into tissue so when your ferritin is you know above like 120 150 
you're starting to store iron into your tissues and that's why you look at transferring, transferring saturation, mm -hmm. you know, total iron binding capacity. And that, that drives more than actually the serum iron because, you know, you can have, yep. you could have a serum iron of like 14, 15, which is, you know, middle of the range, but your ferritin could be 400. And, yep. you know, that, that ferritin is dumped iron into your tissue. It's not in your serum, so your serum level looks good. But the bigger picture is the iron that was in that ferret and has gone off into your cells. Yeah. yeah. Unfortunately, most of the tests in serum for most things are not relevant to anything that we're looking at. Right? No. And people forget that ferritin is also a marker of inflammation. So if your homocysteine is off and your high sensitivity C-reactive protein is off and your ferritin is off, it has nothing to do with your iron storage capacity. It just means that there's inflammation in your liver and you need to address that. So, you know, of course, not everybody understands this, but... Yeah, it's, that's why it's sometimes a bit difficult and complicated to really interpret your blood work results well, and that's why organ imaging is also so important. Mm -hmm. 